Welcome to Molly Vet Centre's What Your Dog Wants You To Know Dog Behaviour and Training Presentation. I am Laura Ryder, I'm a certified professional dog trainer um, and I've worked at Molly Vet for over 20 years uh, and these are my two very cute and very cheeky border terriers, um, Wicket and Milani. Uh, so we're going to talk about a few topics today. Um, the first one we're going to start with is canine communication um, and so how to speak dog. So our dogs, what we classify as non-verbal communicators, they predominantly use body language to communicate with other dogs and also with us. Um, as humans, we're predominantly verbal. Uh, we use some body language, um, but we like to talk. Uh, and so miscommunications and misunderstandings can kind of creep up between us and our dogs um, simply because we communicate so differently. So really important that all of us become really fluent in how dogs talk. So I use the traffic light zone analogy. It's nice and relatable. You probably got stuck at some traffic lights today. Uh, the idea is, is that we can categorize different signals that a, doggy offers, a dog offers with their body and categorize them into three zones, so red, yellow, and green. Uh, now our green is our happy dogs, yellow is our dogs who are feeling stressed, and our red zone is, that's our aggression precursors, our reactive dog. Uh, now the reason we use the traffic light zone analogy uh, is that the yellow light always warns us before a red light. So when we're driving in our car, when it's green, we always get that yellow warning uh, before the red light flicks on. So dogs are exactly the same. Um, a green dog, so a happy, relaxed dog, doesn't jump straight into red zone. There's always some yellow signals that happen first. Um, to the untrained eye though, sometimes those yellow zone um, signals are missed. Uh, and a classic one is I'll hear a client say oh he just lunged at the end of the lead there was no warning uh, but to the trained eye and hopefully you will pick up on some of that today um, to the trained eye what you'll see is you'll see some of the really subtle yellow zone signals before that red zone happens and what we're hoping to do is that if we see our dog feeling a little bit stressed and they're up in that yellow zone we can do something. We can manage that environment. We can take action there uh, and hopefully get our dog back down to green zone by being proactive about it um, rather than the yellow zone and we don't notice it. And then all of it, you know, then it's oh, the dog's in red zone and it's a lot harder to get them to come back and calm down once they're up in that red zone. When we're looking at dog body language, it's really important that we look at the big picture. So our dogs can offer many different signals with all parts of their body, uh, all at the same time. So really important we take it all into account in any given moment. Uh, so as well as noting those individual signs, really important we observe the environment and be aware of potential triggers. So is it an environment that your dog is really comfortable in? And has a trigger just arrived so again they may be happy at home but some small children have arrived and your dog is a little bit worried about them or is it out and about you've taken them out to a new environment somewhere that there can be lots of triggers around uh, that they can possibly react to our dogs also go through conflicting emotional states just like we do. So if we think about going on a roller coaster ride, uh, we can be really excited about it, a little bit nervous, a little bit fearful. Uh, so lots of things going on and the same thing can happen with our dogs. Uh, and we're also going to look at recovery rates. So if we notice our dog get up into a yellow zone, how quickly do they recover? Are they resilient? Uh, do they come back down to green and, and become relaxed really quickly? Or do they stay in that yellow zone and, and they struggle to come back down and relax? Or are they a dog who they're in that yellow zone, um, can't relax and, and they kind of tip up into that red zone um, quickly? Uh, and for those guys, the ones that find it hard to come back down to that green zone, um, they're the ones that um, us as uh, dog training professionals, we want to know about these guys. We want to be able to get in there and help them and, and train new responses to their environment and teach them how to cope and how to be more resilient. So we're going to talk about green zone. Hopefully this is what you see 95% of the time with your dog at home. So we're going to run through it really quickly. Uh, but first of all, we're looking for a real lack of tension. The body's nice and relaxed. The lips are nice and hanging loose around the mouth. The eyes are soft and blinking. The ears are relaxed. 
The tail is what we call a half mast, so it's nice and loose and sweepy. Uh, and they may be even um, offering a play bow or a greeting bow, so really looking at wanting to engage and interact um, with the environment. Moving on, we have our yellow zone. So these are what we call our stress signals. Uh, so as humans, when we get stressed about something, the first thing that happens is we get very tense in our bodies. So some of us get those little worry lines between our, um, you know, between our eyes. Um, we also can get a sore neck or sore shoulders from holding that tension and stress there. Uh, and others get that kind of tense sore jaw from kind of clamping down. Uh, so all of it is tension and it's from a stress response. So if we look at our dogs, the first thing we are looking at here is tension. All the muscles start to tighten up in the body. Uh, and so what happens along with that is those lips start to get drawn back around the mouth. The ears also get drawn back on the head. They're not hanging nice and relaxed anymore. Uh, the brow becomes furrowed. So they can get little kind of those little worry lines between their eyes or over the bridge of their nose. Uh, their pupils start to dilate as well. Then we can look at the whole body uh, and what we're going to talk about now is what we call displacement behaviours. So some displacement behaviours are really normal doggy behaviours but offered out of context uh, are actually stress signals. It's a fiddle response to try and cope with a stress in their environment. So the first one is lip licking. So we're looking at the dog in the middle here. So flicking out their tongue and doing a big lip lick. Uh, so if your dog's just eaten something really yummy and is licking his lips, chances are he just thought that was delicious and is pretty happy about himself. Uh, if however the dog's in a new environment, there's some uh, triggers around that he's a bit worried about it and the rest of the body's looking a little bit stressed and tense uh, and you see some big lip licks, uh, that's the displacement behaviour there. That's him trying to cope with stress. Yawning is another displacement behaviour. So if you've been out walking with your dog, they get home, they do a big yawn, they stretch, they go to their bed, they collapse and go into a nice comfortable sleep. Chances are they were tired. Uh, but if your dog just got up in the morning and you've popped him in the car uh, and he's not really a fan of the car um, and he's sitting there, he's not tired, but he's a bit stressed about being in this environment and you see some big yawns, um, there's some stress yawns that you're observing. Panting is another one. So again, the dog that's been on that big walk, he comes back and he's panting, but his body's nice and relaxed and he decides to go and sprawl out somewhere to cool down. Um, he is just cooling himself down through panting. But if we go to that dog that doesn't like the car and he's sitting in the car, the air conditioning's blowing, it's nice and cool, there's no reason for him to be panting because he's hot, but you start to notice some panting, absolutely, that's your displacement behaviour showing there where he's trying to cope with that stress. They can also get what we call whale eyes. So this is where we can see the white rim around their eye. Um, they're kind of in conflict in this stage. They're looking at something that they perceive as a threat, but at the same time, they're trying to move their body away from it. Uh, and then we've got cowering, moving away, pacing, and their tail really low. Um, so the cowering and moving away, um, with these two, some dogs are really subtle in it, uh, some it's really obvious. So some of them, let's say for moving away, um, they take themselves off into another room. They're like, I'm out of here. Uh, but some of them, what they do is they just shift their weight to their back end a little bit. They just move away that little bit. That's the first sign they're in that yellow zone. So if we see that, hopefully Hopefully we can do something there um, again before they get up into that red zone. Okay, so now we do have the red zone. Hopefully we don't see this with our dogs, but we need to know it's there and, and be prepared if it does happen. Uh, so a few things happen when our dogs get to red zone. First of all, the body becomes really stiff and still uh, with big staring dilated pupils. The hackles can come up. so. This is where the hair will stand up um, along their back. Uh, if you've got a fluffy guy, you'll never see hackles. They've got too much fluff. Um, now, hackles, just really importantly to touch on, is only a sign of arousal. So like we said about in previous slides, it is about reading the big picture. So if we see hackles up and the dog is really stiff and still with big dilated pupils, absolutely he's in red zone. Uh, but if, for example, I've got a little puppy coming down to puppy class and he is 
play bowing and bouncing and he's got his ears pricked forward and he's just really bouncy and excited but his hackles come up a little bit that is just excited arousal um so it one where it's really important we do read the whole picture the tail becomes quite high on the body with this and it can be very stiff and snarling growling barking lunging the ones we kind of know uh, so really important to know um, that if we look at a dog in their nice relaxed state you can see the guy on the left here um, compared to a guy in yellow zone on the right um, really important to get to know your dog so all dogs are kind of built different shapes and sizes um, so observe your dog be mindful of it and it's a good one to watch other dogs as well it's amazing what you'll pick up on Okay, so most aggression and reactivity is fear-based and this is one that we kind of need to remind ourselves of because what happens is our dog is offering what's called distance increasing behaviours. So those red zone behaviours, the snarling, the growling, the barking, the lunging, what they're doing is they're trying to make the stressor go away. So they're kind of trying to throw the, the first punch because they're scared. So it's like I'm going to act big and tough in the hope that you leave me alone. Now, sometimes what happens is if our dog does get into red zone, um, it can be a little bit embarrassing. We don't want a dog that's barking and growling and lunging at the end of their lead. Uh, and so we kind of jump in and think we might have a quick fix. And what we do is we start to tell the dog off for red zone. Uh, now, the issue that happens here is that, first of all, it's only going to increase their anxiety. Remember, it is fear based if they're already really fearful about something and then we start telling them off and getting grumpy at them. Um, it's only going to make it worse. Now, we may extinguish the aggression precursor. And what I mean by that is that if we punish a dog off, let's say for growling um, and we do it often enough, we may get rid of the growl, but the underlying fear and anxiety still remains. And the scary part is we now may have potentially have a dog that bites without warning. So the example I use here is little Fluffy comes to the vet clinic and is a little bit worried about seeing the vet. Uh, so sitting in the reception area, showing some yellow zone signals. So lip licking, um, cowering, uh, and then what happens is the vet actually approaches. So the trigger is worse now the vet's near so little fluffy starts to growl now fluffy's owner is a bit embarrassed because fluffy is now growling at the vet so fluffy's owner is like fluffy no and starts to kind of reprimand fluffy um, now again we may get rid of that growl but fluffy still is really scared about the vet and the vet clinic so now what we've potentially done is have a dog that doesn't have a warning system and can potentially bite uh, so Ian Dunbar says it beautifully, punishing a growl is like taking the batteries out of a smoke alarm. Now we're going to talk about responses to stress. So we have a dog who's gone to yellow, possibly red zone. Um, so they're stressed. How do they cope with that? Uh, they actually cope with it in the same way that us humans do. They have four options. Uh, now I am about to put a spider on the screen. I always warn everyone just in case. So there he is. So what we can offer as humans, if we um, are fearful of spiders, we can offer fight, flight, freeze, or fiddle. So fight, we go get the can of mortine or the rolled up newspaper. Flight, we kind of run and leave the room and we refuse to go back into the room until the spider is gone. Freeze is where you kind of stand still, you're frozen in fear and you're like, ah, oh, it's a spider. Um, and the fiddle one is where you kind of scream and jump up and down on the spot. Uh, so all of us are different and we can all offer those different responses um, and our dogs will do the same. So we're going to have a look at them individually now. Okay, first of all, flight. If I'm worried about something, I can move away from it, uh, which sounds pretty logical. Uh, sometimes what happens though, especially out and about, is our dogs are on lead. So they don't have the option of flight. So this guy here has moved as far as he can to the end of his lead. He's very stiff in his body. You can see a lot of yellow zone uh, body language going on there that he's really uncomfortable about it. Um, so he's kind of tried flight. I'm going to try and back off and move away from the thing I'm worried about. But that lead is keeping him there. Flight can also happen off lead. So this is a guy who's decided that he's going to go and use flight and go and hide behind the couch, so move away from something. 
Uh, this one I use the example of a dog who's maybe not been socialized around little kids, um, you know, as a young dog. And so maybe is a little bit worried about little kids. And so friends come over and bring their little kids and they see him and they're like, oh, it's the doggy from 101 Dalmatians. And they so want to go and pat him. Um, but everything about his body language is saying, no, thank you. Uh, so his ears are pulled back, very tense in the face. You can see that whale eye and he's cowering behind that couch. Now, again, to the untrained eye, someone doesn't notice this and allows the kids to keep approaching. This dog may then move away, so choose flight again, go to another area of the house, try to move himself away. Um, but he will come to a point where possibly if no one helps him here, he gets trapped, he reaches threshold. These kids have been following him around for a while now um, that he decides flight isn't working for him anymore. Uh, and sadly, that's when, um, you know, it can make the newspapers because it's a dog that's bitten um, a child. Uh, and it's a really sad statistic that 75% of dog bites um, are to children uh, it's by a dog that the child knows. So really important that we're aware of this um, and we're observing our dogs. Okay, flight can also happen when we're out and about with our dogs. So um, I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with our doggy parks. Uh, I kind of compare them to mosh pits. So there can be a lot of dogs there. There can be a lot of high arousal for a lot of the adolescent dogs. Sure, they can think that it's a great time and it's a big party for everyone. Uh, but for a lot of dogs, it's too much. So the guy in the middle here, um, cowering down to the ground, moving away, ears pinned back and looking like he's giving a bit of a warning growl or a bark to the other dogs. Now he is off lead. So you think, well, he should be able to go move away to somewhere he feels safe. Um, but sometimes with the really busy places with so much high arousal going on um, is he's got nowhere safe to go because it's just so busy. Um, so be mindful of that when you're out and about. Now we have our freeze response. So this is one that sometimes is missed because outwardly the dog isn't doing anything. He looks like he's, you know, he's sitting there, he's tolerating it. Um, but again, we look at this dog's um, facial expression. We can see the wrinkles, the ears pulled back, very tense, um, clamped shut jaw, uh, pupils starting to dilate, uh, and he's kind of cowering down to the ground. Now he's offering a freeze response here, but for how long, you know, how, what procedure is happening here um, before he may end up choosing a different response. So we want to be able to see the freeze um, and be able to help the dog here. What can we do differently? How can we reassess this situation to make him a bit more comfortable? Freeze can also happen with little guys that roll onto their back. Um, I shouldn't say just little guys, the big guys can do it as well. Uh, so with our freeze here, the main thing we're looking for is tension. So this guy, you can see all the muscles are really tense in that little body. Um, we're not going to go up and try and give him a belly rub. It's not what he's asking for. He's free. He, it's a freeze response and he's really not comfortable about um, this person taking his photo. Um, some more photos of our freeze responses. Uh, again, this is about being handled with uh, people. So you can look at both of these dogs in their face and their body and see that they're really uncomfortable about it. Um, we're going to focus on the little guy down the bottom. So again, tense mouth, big dilated pupils, ears pulled back outwardly, not doing anything, uh, but saying a lot. Uh, and again, in this situation, He's tolerating it here, uh, but if this little girl kind of squeezed his face a little bit more or even worse, she decided she was going to reach over and give him a kiss on the nose because he's so cute, um, what may he do then? Again, is this going to be another one that makes the papers that someone's been bitten by a dog um, and we hear it. There was no warning, um, but this guy, it's not outwardly saying anything, but there are a lot of warning signals going on here. Now we have our fiddle responses. So we spoke a little bit about them previously with our displacement behaviours. So the lip licking and the yawning are two classic ones. Uh, dogs can also do a fiddle scratch as well. So again, this is about um, observing their environment and what else the body is doing as well. So absolutely, if your dog has some mild allergies and it's that time of year and he's having a bit of a scratch because he's a bit itchy, Yep, normal response. Uh, if he's been outside rolling in the sand and the dirt and then he comes in and he's got doing a bit of an itch, you know, because he's kind of a bit itchy from that sand in his coat, again, perfectly normal. 
But if we see tension in the body, if it's an environment that's maybe slightly stressful to them and they start to do this scratching, um, absolutely be aware it can be a fiddle response. And we also can do fiddle sniffing as well. So what happens here is that again, we're looking for tension in the body. Uh, it can often happen when it's two new dogs uh, meeting. They'll tend to circle around each other, read each other's body language a little bit and weigh up. Are you friendly? Should I go closer? Should I say hello? Uh, and if they're not sure, uh, what they'll do is they'll kind of go, oh, I'm not sure. Uh, are you friendly? Um, I'll go over here and pretend I'm really busy sniffing. So there's no actual sniff smell there they're just going to do something else um, to you know to fiddle and cope with that response now we have our fight response uh, so with our fight response again looking at body language here big dilated pupils we have teeth out very tense in the face and um, that tail is coming down quite low on the body and those ears are pulled back and another example of fight response as well again very similar facial expression here um, with these guys, again, we have to remember this is a fear-based response and these guys, it's distance increasing behaviors. They're saying, I am scared, go away. So how do we help our dogs? Um, I could spend an hour just on this slide, uh, but two things to keep in mind when you're out and about. Number one, distance is your friend. So if your dog is showing some yellow signals, they're a little bit worried about something, think about moving them. Let's move them away from the trigger. Let's give them a bit of space. Let's see if they can return to green and then possibly observe from a distance. Uh, and also really importantly, seek professional help. So that's what we're here for. Um, if we are seeing dogs in the, um, have things in their environment that they perceive as threats, um, there is lots that we can do to help them to change that emotional state and make them feel more confident and more resilient in their world. Okay, doggies and their cute wagging tails. Uh, so that old wives tale of, oh, you know, he's he's wagging his tail, he must be friendly, um, is slowly disappearing, which is good, uh, but it is still around a little bit. So we're going to talk about a few different things our dogs do with their tails. So we do absolutely have the happy wag. What we do is we say um, that it's held at half mast and this is half mast for your dog. So each breed of dog, they all have kind of different set tails. Some hold it a lot higher on the body. Some have naturally low set tails. So it is roughly half mast for your particular dog. Uh, the body is really relaxed and it's a really nice sweepy wag. And again, I'm sure you see this wag 99% of the time. Then we have our fearful and our stressed dogs. So again, we're looking for that tension uh, and the tail becomes really low. The body can be very stiff, uh, but that tail can be still wagging. And again, sometimes that's where miscommunication happens because people see it and go, oh, he's fine. He's wagging his tail. But everything about this picture here um, is saying, no, I'm really stressed. We then have our reactive dogs as well. So again, we're looking for stiffness and what happens is that tail comes really high up on the body. So again, this is about your dog and where they hold their tail, but really high up on the body and there's a real stiffness to it and it can be wagging. It can be wagging pretty fast, but it's really stiff. Uh, and again, another one where miscommunications happen, people just see the wag and go, oh, he's fine. Um, but they don't see the stiffness and the stillness and all the, the other uh, reactive red zone signs that are going along with it. Okay, this cute little picture. So we're going to talk about a shake off. Uh, so when you wash your dog and then you get soaked because they shake and water goes everywhere, um, they're doing that to dispel water out of their coat, so to dry themselves off. Uh, but if you see your dog doing a shake off, so that same action, but they're dry, what they're actually doing is getting rid of tension. So what happens is they may have been in a um, state of high arousal and then they're shaking it off and coming back down to lower arousal. Uh, so it can happen in a few different scenarios. It can be used in a stressful environment. So the dog was a little bit stressed about something, that stress is then alleviated. So the dog does a shake off and comes back down to green zone. 
Uh, it can also happen in play. So if play is getting a little bit full on, uh, arousal levels are kind of going up, uh, you will find that one or both the dogs may break away, kind of have a bit of a breather and do a shake off and again, just come back down to a slightly calmer level. So I'm going to show you a video in a moment because it is a lot easier um, to see a shake off than see it in, capture it in a photo um, and I'm going to chat you through it. Okay, so really nice roly poly play with these two um, re retrievers. The one in the front is an adolescent, um, the one at the back is um, an adult dog and the adult dog gets his tail pulled on by it. So there's a bit of a scuffle and then you see all the stiffness kind of happening. So stiffness and then you can see a nice big shake off like oh phew okay we're okay so again this was just a little bit of inappropriate play a bit high arousal from the younger dog the older dog said hey mind your manners there was a quick little like settle down um, but they respected that you saw the stiffness but then there was that nice shake off and everything returned to normal um, now I apologize in advance for the next video but you will never it's gonna be all right Okay, so again, you will never forget the shake off. Um, if I had a dollar for every time I saw a dog do a shake off as they walked out of the vet clinic, um, I could buy some really cool toys for my dogs. Um, so keep that in mind. The shake off is a really nice one to watch for as they come back down to that calmer level. Now, if you would like more of the body language info and have it readily available um, right at your fingertips, um, the Dog Decoder app um, is a really, really good little app um, available for iPhone and Android. Uh, so all the body language uh, signals we spoke about um, in the last 20 minutes, they're all there um, in really nice little diagrams, explanations about what your dog, dog is doing and what that means. Uh, so great for educating us as dog owners, really good for educating friends and family um, and also a really nice one to help with kids and dogs get along safely. Okay, next topic we're going to cover is social skills for dogs. So polite greetings and appropriate play. So dogs are social species just like us. So when we were little, we were taught to, to share, to take turns, to cooperate, to work together. Um, we weren't born with these skills. Um, our caregivers taught that, our role models taught us that. Uh, and the same thing happens with our dogs. It's important to give them experiences so that they can learn appropriate social skills. Uh, they're definitely not just born with them. So we're gonna look at how they establish these social skills. It does all start with mum and litter mates. Uh, so first of all, they learn what's called bite inhibition when they're interacting with their litter mates. So this means uh, that obviously dogs mouth and bite to play, um, but they do it with a soft mouth. So if one puppy plays too hard, bites too hard and is too rough, the others might kind of yelp and run away and kind of be like, I don't want to play with you. You, you know, you're a big mean bully. And so they'll start to adjust their play so that the other puppies will come back and interact with them. Uh, Mum is a bit of a referee at this stage. Uh, she does a lot of what's called splitting behaviour. So this is where if play is getting too full on, she will simply split it up. She'll walk between the two puppies and just diffuse the situation. So just a simple walking between them can often um, decrease arousal levels. Uh, you will see a lot of adult dogs do this. Once you know what splitting is, you see it a lot. So you will see uh, a lot of nice social adult dogs do this if things kind of escalate and get a little bit too full on with other dogs around, they'll just step between them, just calmly step between and it's just like a, hey, can't settle down. We then have that socialization period. So this is where we have to make sure we're giving our puppies lots and lots of positive experiences with being calm and polite around other dogs, um, greeting lots of different people, and also exposing them in a really positive way to different environments. So we only get one chance at this socialization period. So really um, important that we make the most of it and give them lots and lots of positive experiences to build up that confidence about their world. 
We also look at appropriate activities for our dogs as we venture through with them. Uh, so lots of um, training classes and, and fun workshops are available out and about. Um, and the idea is that we're going to focus on engaging and playing with their owner and building that bond and having that really nice relationship. Um, do seek out qualified pet care professionals. Uh, what you will find is the dog training industry is completely unregulated. Uh, so there's some lovely people out there that can have the absolute best of intentions um, and want to, you know, set up their doggy daycare and set up, you know, some, you know, pet training services. Uh, but really important that they go out and they've spent the time to make sure that they have, you know, the knowledge to give your dog the best possible start. Then we can talk about dog-dog interactions. So how they should greet each other appropriately, cut off signals when they're kind of saying, no, I've had enough and also different play styles. So we're gonna delve into that a little bit further. So dog-dog interactions, when we go out and about with our dogs, uh, before we go and say hello, there are some things we need to be mindful of. Um, first of all, I suggest you follow the one in 10 ratio for greetings. What this means is for every 10 dogs you see out and about, your dog actually gets to physically say hello to one of them. Um, if we allow our dog to say hi to too many dogs, um, it can go a bit pear-shaped. Um, not every dog is going to be um, really eager to say hi to every other dog. Uh, and if you look at us, we're kind of the same. We have our close group of friends that we play nicely with uh, and the rest of the population we're just polite to. You might walk you know, along the street and smile and say good morning to someone someone um, but you don't walk along the street and run up to everyone and say do you want to come to my house for dinner and then the next person do you want to come to my house for dinner and the next person do you want to come to my house for dinner um you could imagine like if i did that people would start phoning the police you know there's this crazy lady out there trying to get people to go to her house uh but we kind of put that expectation on our dogs. They should go up and say hi to everyone. Um, and that's really unrealistic for them. Um, they should have a close group of doggy friends. Everyone else, they're just polite with. So follow roughly that one to 10 ratio um, and things should go well. Now, when we're choosing that one in 10, um, how do we go about that? First of all, we need to assess um, the other dog and the owner. We also need to read the body language of our own dog uh, and we're going to run through it now, the simple steps to some polite greetings. So how do we assess and then how do we go about doing it? So I always ask the question, shall we go and say hello? So this one, I'm out and about and there is a dog and the owner is on their phone. Um, I don't say hi to this dog purely because that owner they're busy doing something else. They're not connected with their dog. They're not 100% like in the moment to be able to make sure that that interaction goes well. Um, you know, they're busy doing something else and that's fine, but I don't know that other dog. I don't know how it's going to go. I need that owner present. Um, so this one, I'm going to give it a miss. Okay, this little cutie with a ball in its mouth um, looks pretty happy, bouncy, you know, eager to interact. But there's a toy and this can sometimes cause issues out and about with our dogs. So this dog has chosen, I want to play with my ball. Uh, and that's fine. That's the game they've chosen to do at this particular time. So I'm not going to go and approach this dog with my dog because that's not what this little guy is after at the moment. Um, there's a lot of issues with other dogs running up and trying to steal another dog's toy or trying to join in the game. And this little guy doesn't want the game of keep the ball off the dog. This dog is like, I want to play ball with my with my owner. Um, and that is fine. So do be mindful of that when we're out and about. Um, toys can sometimes cause a few issues. All right, this one, we're completely reading body language with this little sweetheart. Um, really, really scared in this environment. Um, ears pulled back, huge dilated pupils, very tense in the face, cowering and hiding between mum's legs. Um, there's no way I'd be going anywhere near this um, little guy. Um, so worried about the world that I feel that if we approached even a little bit closer, this dog would be in red zone. This would be the dog that's like barking, growling, snapping at the end of the lead, like completely petrified and scared. So reading the other dog's body language is really, really important this sweet oldie. Um, this isn't a yes or no as if we say hi to this dog. Um, this one is really about 
our dog. So if I also have an older dog who's just kind of hanging about, having a sniff, wandering around, um, I might check with the other owner. Oh, can they say hi? Um, Because it will just be like a little sniff. Hey, how are you? And kind of off they go again. Uh, They're not going to do big, bouncy, crazy, roly-poly play. Um, If I have a nine-month-old 40-kilo puppy, though, um, you know, bouncy and excited and still learning social skills so can be a bit over-enthusiastic about the world, um, I'm probably not going to say hi to this one. Um, One, this guy, you know, eyesight might be fading a little bit, and so this big bouncy puppy rushing up and getting in his face may be all too much for him. Uh, And also he's older. He may have a bit of arthritis in those hips. Um, He doesn't want a big bouncy dog kind of pushing and shoving him around. All right, this guy here. Um, so he's looking calm but interested, so not pulling on the lead, being all over aroused and crazy, and not kind of showing any signs of being fearful or worried either. Um, nice soft face, ears perked forward, um, tail at half mast. Uh, this one though, what I am going to point out is this dog is on lead, um, and our leads kind of again something that causes issues a little bit out and about. So if it is two dogs on lead. I will do a quick little sniff, hello, how are you, move along if both dogs are looking comfortable. If, however, one dog is off lead and one is on lead, I'm not going to let the interaction happen. I'm moving, I'm getting out of there. Um, We're really setting up that dog who's on lead, can't interact naturally, can't move away, um, and so things can kind of go pear-shaped. So... If they're on lead, both of them, a quick little sniff, hello, how are you, that's it, off we go. Um, But if there's one off and one on, um, it's a no-go zone. It just can um, cause too many issues. All right, we have our little guys playing. So our little guys, they're doing like fast zoomy play, all look pretty happy and kind of zooming and having lots of fun. Um, We then have our Great Danes. Again, really bouncy, exaggerated movements, looking like they're having lots of fun. So separately, sure, these guys look like they're having having a great time. But I have, let's say, a 6 kilo Shih Tzu on the left and a 60 kilo Great Dane in the middle. Um, High energy, fast paced, zoomy play. I'm not going to let the big guys and the little guys play that together. Um, The big guys won't mean to, may not mean to, but can really accidentally bowl over a little guy and send them flying um, and cause an injury all too quickly and it all go pear-shaped. So high arousal games with big guys and little guys, um, I recommend steer clear of. Uh, Saying that though, um, I'm not saying big guys and little guys shouldn't play. Um, I think it's really important they get used to dogs of all different sizes. And um, there's lovely big dogs out there who play beautifully with little guys. And this picture here, what they're doing is the big guy is doing what's called self-handicapping. So the big guy is getting down to the little guy's level. So getting down, they often do roly-poly play like here. They may do kind of um, bitey mouth kind of um, play as well. But if the big guy gets down and self-handicaps, absolutely, they can you know have a nice little interaction. Um, but um, please do avoid the really fast-paced zoomy play with the biggies and the little e's together. Okay, now we're going to talk about polite greetings. So we've gone through, we've answered those questions, we've found that one in ten dog of who we're going to say hi to. Um, The first thing we need to be mindful of is that dogs have personal space just like we do. So we're going to put it in human terms. You meet someone new uh, and so you greet them and you say, you give them a handshake, hi, how are you? And then what you tend to do is you take a little step backwards. So you release their hand and you move out of their personal space. Now you've all met that person who doesn't respect personal space and so they say hi to you they hug you or they um, you know they hug you and you've never met them before or they shake your hand and then they kind of step closer into you and you start to feel really uncomfortable and awkward and you start to feel that tension because they're in your personal space and you don't know them and you may try to kind of back away out of it So the same thing can happen with our dogs. So as they kind of get in each other's personal space to do a little sniff, hello, how are you? It's really quick. It's really important that it's quick. It's brief. Hi, how are you? Get out of personal space because I don't know you. 
if we allow them to stay in each other's personal space for too long, makes it really uncomfortable and you start to see that tension build just like it would um, for those, you know, those human um, greeters that don't respect personal space. So what we do is we follow what's called the three second rule. So what we're going to do is we're going to have ticked all the boxes, answered the questions that we've about, are we going to say hello? Uh, we've read body language. We've checked with the other owner. Is it okay for my dog to say hello? And then we're going to let them do three seconds or less. So no more than three. Sniff hello, how are you? We're then going to call our dog away. Now we can call them away in a few ways. We could use name game. Uh, we could use a little treat on their nose to call them away and then kind of reinforce them. You know, you did such a good job. You said hello, good, well done. Uh, but three seconds, that's it. Hello, how are you? Get out of personal space. And when they're doing this, we're looking for body language. So the guys on the left here, we're looking for that curved, relaxed body. So they're doing what dogs do. They're having a good sniff, um, but everything about their body is nice and relaxed compared to the guys on the right. So guys on the right, our little puppy, you can see the weight is shifted onto those back legs, um, very tight and tense in the face. And those ears are kind of pulled back. Uh, then the other guy, you can see uh, a lot of hackles coming up. Um, tail is very high and stiff, uh, very stiff in the face and both their bodies. Again, a lot of tension in it. So I would have preferred that these guys didn't even get that close to say hi. I would have hoped to have seen some body language before it got that close and kind of called them away um, beforehand. But if it gets to a point where it's this close, I'm going to take action now. I'm calling both dogs away and diffusing the situation because both of them are really uncomfortable in each other's personal space. Now, I then get clients asking me, well, is this how they say hi to dogs forever? You know, three seconds, is that it? Um, think about it with us. If you're going to go and see someone that you don't know terribly well, you're going to do a handshake, you know. Um, but if you're going to go visit your mum, so if I'm going to go see mum tomorrow, uh, I'm not going to walk into her house and go, hi, mum, and shake her hand. Um, you know, my mum gets a big hug and a kiss from me. So people we have relationships with, so our close friends, our close family, we are more comfortable in their personal space. So we're more comfortable to go in and give them a hug and a kiss. So you will see with your dog, the same things start to happen. They may not hug and kiss, but what you will see is that that greeting, they'll start to recognize that friend. They'll be like, oh, hey, it's my doggy friend that I saw the other day. And they'll go up and they'll be more comfortable in each other's personal space. And then they'll start to initiate play. Now, when they are playing, we're watching for lots of different things. We're looking for a real curvy body language, really bouncy and exaggerated movements. So if we think about little kids, when they're playing and they're excited about something, they don't just walk somewhere. They skip and they run and they bounce. And so our dogs are the same when they're playing. It's big and it's bouncy and exaggerated. They will also be offering uh, play bows and pauses. So now we're going to look at a couple of um, slides here uh, with some more body language. So first of all, these two guys here, uh, teeth out, um, but bouncy, exaggerated movements, a bit high arousal. I'd be managing this, um, but absolutely, um, you know, both of them are kind of having fun at the moment. They are like little kids. It could go pear shaped rather quickly, but at the moment it's loose and it's bouncy. Compared to these two guys here, a lot of tension in the body here with these two. So again, being really mindful of the difference in their body postures. Now, when they're playing as well, um, as well as that big bouncy exaggerated movements, they kind of get that goofy play face as well. Um, so they should look, you know, like little kids look when they're having fun, like big grins ear to ear, like lots of kind of soft, relaxed faces, tongues lolling out um, and really nice, bouncy, relaxed um, bodies. Now back to the play bows and pauses. This is how we make sure that the, the play is, is going appropriately. So a play bow is used to initiate play uh, and a pause. What happens with a pause is that the dog will pause for a moment. Um, arousal levels decrease and it gives them a moment to check in with the other dog. So it's kind of a question. Are you still having fun? And if the other dog offers a play bow to re-engage, then yep, absolutely. They'll go back in and start having fun again. 
So I'm going to show you a video of my two guys in a moment. Um, they're little terriers. They like to wrestle and have a good little play. Um, but we're going to observe for some little pauses and play bows in this. Okay, so they're wrestling. Pause, play, bow, re-engage. Pause, play, bow, re-engage. Pause, play, bow, re-engage. Okay, so they like to wrestle. Um, they're kind of bouncy and having lots of fun with it, but there was those little check-ins. You still having fun? And then that re-engage, yep, let's do that again. Now, dogs can have different play styles, and we've seen some already in this session. So the retrievers doing the roly-poly play, um, my two guys now just doing um, the uh, wrestling uh, the little guys and the Danes doing the chasey play uh, and Milani, who's my little female in the video, um, one of her other really good doggy friends um, is Parker, who's a Border Collie and they don't wrestle, they chase and so they flat out hoon around my paddock and then they'll both pause, they'll come to a screeching stop almost at the same time. They look at each other, play bow and then they go again so there's these little moments where they check in and make sure that they're having fun um, it's often when they'll change direction it's often when they'll change who's chasing who um, and it's really nice to watch now if it's two adolescent dogs playing and I don't see any pauses it's getting a little bit too high arousal there might be a bit of tension starting in the body um, I will prompt some pauses so I may use some little treaties or their name game and kind of go pop 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 pops kind of call them to me to kind of diffuse the situation um, maybe ask for a little sit yes give them that treaty and then free go play again so just helping them come back decrease arousal levels off you go again so um, just like little kids um, when they're little we're kind of there we're not micromanaging but we're there to support and help them when needed um, really important we're doing that for our adolescent dogs as well Okay, a quick little one I want to talk about now is development and sociability. So this is inside our canine brain. So our dogs go through similar development processes as what we do, just in a very condensed time frame. So our juvenile pups, these are kind of like our toddlers and our primary school kids. Um, most of them are really highly social. You think about, you know, little kids, they've got a new best friend at school every week. Um, they are really dependent on primary caregivers though. So we think about the um, little toddler who, you know, is happy to venture off a little bit, but needs that security of coming back to mum and dad as well. And that kind of builds as they get older. So the same thing happens with our pups. Then the fun stage happens. So this is when our dogs become adolescents or teenagers. Uh, so they're still usually pretty um, highly social. They start to develop some close friendships. Um, but the challenging bit um, is that they start to become increasingly independent and they take risks. Now that goes on and then we get the adult dog. So with the adult dog, firm friendships are established. And what happens with the adult dog, for majority of them, is sociability actually decreases. Now, this doesn't mean that all of a sudden they don't want to be, they don't want to be friends with anyone. Um, what it means is they're just not as open to new friendships. And, you know, again, if we compare them to us, we're kind of the same. As adults, we're pretty comfortable in our close social groups. Um, we don't have a new best friend every week like we did when we were little. We don't go to the big teenage parties like we used to um, you know we're just more comfortable with being with people we know uh, and the same thing happens with our adult dogs and it's often when we can see issues start to creep in because that adolescent dog has just become an adult and instead of loving that mosh pit that is the dog park um, they can start to have a few issues and not want to be there they don't want to hang out at the teenage parties anymore um, and that is perfectly fine now, as far as ages on this, our young pups, we're looking up to about four to five months of age, um, and then they will become a teenager. Um, the important numbers I want you to remember for this, though, is teenage to adulthood happens at around two years of age. Uh, so this... Um, causes some issues for our dogs this number because we talk about a dog being an adult at one year of age uh, and physically they're pretty much fully grown at one 
but socially they've still got a lot of development to go. And if we look at ourselves, the same thing happens. We put a number, 18 is when adult, you know, we become an adult. And if we look back to our 18 year old selves, we may have thought we were really mature, but in actual fact, we, we weren't fully growing up. We weren't completely developed. Um, social maturity in humans, um, they reckon on average is kind of mid twenties. Now, if we go back to our dogs, we put this, they're, a do they're an adult at one year of age, kind of label on them. Um, issues uh, kind of creep in. So a lot of our rescue organizations, our shelter groups, um, the average age of dogs in their care are dogs between 18 months and two years of age. Uh, now, the reason for this, the predominant reason, is that dog's been a puppy. You know, the owner thinks, oh, he'll grow out of it. He's just a puppy. And then at a year of age, the owner has new expectations. This is now an adult dog. You should start acting like an adult. Why are you still being a puppy? Why are you still taking risks? Um, and so the bond is broken. They start to believe that they have a bad dog. Um, and sadly, they can then be the dog is then relinquished into a shelter um, or a rescue organization. So really, really important to know um, that our dogs really are teenagers up to two years of age. Um, there's no magic cure for teenagehood. Um, clear, calm and consistent um, is always my advice. Uh, and also, um, get into training, have fun with them, bond with them, have that, re have that relationship with them um, and they'll get there. Okay, we're going to really quickly run through some environmental enrichment and what I'm going to send you guys away with is to hopefully for, um, to give a go with the no food bowl challenge. So dogs need jobs to do or they will create their own. Uh, historically, they naturally spent hours a day hunting and foraging for food. Uh, we then domesticated them thousands of years ago, uh, but we domesticated them for working purposes. So they would spend hours a day working in a specific role. We would then give them food out of a bowl because they'd worked all day doing jobs for us. So they kind of got a free feed, um, but they spent hours a day um, working. So important, first of all, for us to think about looking at our individual dog and what were they bred to do? Uh, because what you'll find is there is only um, a small percentage of dog breeds that were bred just for companionship. Majority of them out there were bred for a working purpose. So they do need a job to do. So we have our gun dogs, our retrieving breeds, our terriers, our herding breeds, our guarding breeds, um, so many different roles that our dogs have and done for us over the years. Um, and our pet dogs now have a, have a pretty sweet life. Uh, but along with that um, can creep in some boredom issues. They now don't have a daily job to do. They don't have that outlet for that instinct and that energy. And so we can often see some destructive issues, excessive high energy and inappropriate behaviors um, like this guy here. So what can we do instead for our pet dogs? Because they're not out, you know, working 10 hours on a farm anymore, for example. Uh, so first of all, we need to find an outlet for our dog's instincts and also give them interactive ways to work for their food every day. Uh, so I suggest we throw out the food bowl and we feed the fun way. So I'm going to run through some ideas now with you. Um, you will find you can spend a small fortune on interactive doggy toys uh, or I'm going to give you some really simple easy cheap options as well so you pick and choose what you think is going to work for your dog. So we're going to start with the Kongs. They're made of really hard um, durable rubber. Uh, we stuff it full of yummy wet food and they also come in lots of different sizes so you can get them for every size dog under the sun. And we can teach the game and then build up the challenge of the Kong. So novice dogs, we're just going to stuff the wet food really lightly in there. Um, I use a lot of the Prime 100 Poloni roll, so I chop that up and stuff that in there. Uh, we can help the dog a little bit by holding the Kong and encouraging them. Once they've kind of got that down to a fine art, we move on to the intermediate option where we can start to really stuff that food in firmly so it's harder to get out. And we leave it with them independently. We don't need to hold it and help them. They can kind of lie there happily on their mat while we're doing something else and they can be working on it. 
Again, once they're really happy with that, uh, the advanced guys, what we can do with them to really challenge them and give them a really fun job is that we're going to stuff it full of yummy food and then we're going to freeze it. Um, so again, it just takes longer for the food to come out. Um, and again, instead of just giving them the Kong, go hide it somewhere. Let them use their amazing noses and go and find the yummy, the yummy Kong. We then have the treat balls, uh, quite a few different ones on the market, similar to your Kongs, your Kongs for wet food, your treat balls are for your dry food. Uh, so again, different options. Uh, so we can, to start with, just put in um, some dry food. You can absolutely use some little dry treats as well. Um, and we can help the dog a little bit, show them, move it a little bit, encourage them to kind of interact with it. Then we can get them working independently. And my final one, this is how I feed um, my guys a lot of the time is that I use the, so these are the Kong wobblers. So I'll put their food in there. I will then rest a tennis ball on top and then um, do up the lid. And basically what the tennis ball does is it just blocks that hole every now and again so the food doesn't come out as quickly. Uh, Kong have a lot of different um, products on the market. Um, so have a look around, see what you think your dog might like. Uh, there's also the Canine Connectables. Uh, these are a fairly new one on the market, um, but these are really cool. These are um, definitely my dog's um, top picks. Uh, and they, um, you, again, you can stuff them with food. Um, they can go in the freezer, so you can stuff and freeze them. And then they all click and join together to kind of make it kind of a food puzzle for them to work out and chew on and play with. Uh, little kids um, play pools. We can put lots of different things. So we could put the balls in there. That's my guys in there getting their uh, dinner out of it. Uh, for a dog that likes to dig, we can redirect them to an appropriate digging area. So popping some sand in it with some toys and some treats to encourage them to use that. Um, I also use a lot of um, indoor digging pits. So I get some old towels from the back of the linen cupboard, chuck them into the pool, um, add some food to it, um, and my dogs will get in there and they'll dig and scratch and rummage around and have lots of fun trying to find the food. Uh, and absolutely, we can put some water in it. You know, lots of dogs love to have a bit of a splash and a play around. So, you know, something, one little toy that you can do lots of different things with. Nothing goes in my recycle bin until I've had a look at it and decided if my dogs can play with it. Uh, so egg cartons, cereal boxes, empty toilet rolls, anything like that. Uh, again, you can pop some of their food in it, close the lid uh, and then give it to them. They can pull it apart and shred it and have lots of fun um, working to get their food. Uh, occasionally I get a client who's like, oh, Laura, I've then got bits of cardboard all around the house. And, and that's fine. They can use something else um, instead of cardboard boxes. Um, but my suggestion is I say, but I know, but your reticulation's still in the ground and your pot plants are still in one piece this week. So a win-win. Um, really quickly on plastic bottles, um, I take the um, lid off, uh, pop some food in there, then they can crunch and chew and shake it to play with it. Um, the plastic bottles do make sure you are 100% supervising this game, purely because 95% of dogs will just chew and crunch and shake till they get all the food out and then it'll stop, finish the game. But there's that small percentage who then think it might be fun to chew up the bottle and ingest it. Um, so if you have a dog who you think might like to ingest pieces of things and maybe avoid the plastic bottles. Uh, popsicles are another nice little one as well. Uh, so I use um, either a little silicon mold, um, an empty plastic container, or I do use a lot of the Glad Ziploc sandwich bags. Uh, pop some of their food in, you can put some treats in there. You're then going to fill it with water, uh, freeze it, and then the next day you can take it out of the container, put it out on the lawn, and they can lick and chew and crunch and play with it. Uh, there's also lots of food puzzles and slow feed bowls out there as well. Um, so the idea again is instead of them being able to hoover it up, you know, hoover that food up in a matter of seconds, um, everything just takes that little bit longer. They've got to work and use those brains and interact with that toy to work to get that food out. Uh, also, we use snuffle mats and licky mats. So these are really nice enrichment ones, but I do use them a lot for husbandry skills as well. So the snuffle mat up the top, uh, I just use some dry food, uh, scatter it on. Uh, so it's just polar fleece on a rubber mat and all the food kind of disappears down into all the little pieces of fabric. So they've got to sniff and snuffle and use their nose to find all the little bits of food that's hidden in the pieces of fabric. 
Uh, and then the licky mats, um, they're just little pot holders. Um, Kmart, Big W uh, have them. I think they're about $2. Uh, and I use, I tend to use the baby food. You can use any sort of wet food, but the baby food's a good consistency. Um, and I'll squeeze a blob in and kind of rub it into all of those little grooves. And the idea is that they can lick at it. Um, and it takes them quite a while to get all the yummy food out of all of the little grooves. Uh, now, the reason I use these for husbandry and handling um, is that I am reinforcing my dog for being handled. Um, I'm also kind of distracting them a little bit. So they've got a job to do while I'm doing things to them. Um, and it also kind of keeps them relatively still. So they're kind of in one spot, um, which means that I can kind of go about what I need to do. So I might um, have the snuffle mat out. And while they're sniffing and snuffling, I could trim some nails. I could get some brushing done. I might wipe out their ears. We're going to start really gradually with it, um, introduce the handling skills um, really slowly. Um, we do have another little video on um, on our website um, that does go through that. Uh, but um, absolutely, snuffle mats and licky mats um, are a favourite in my household. Okay, last little topic we're going to zoom through. Um, so the perfect pet dog, and this is the perfect pet dog um, in your eyes. Uh, and I'm sure you've already started some training. Um, but if not, the training starts now. And there's a few things that we're going to have a think about. So first of all, we need to make sure we manage the environment as best as we possibly can. We want to set our dog up to succeed. So as much as possible, we'll take temptation out of the way. Uh, so it is like having a toddler in the house, um, puppy and dog proof the house, you know, um, the car keys and the TV remote and your sunglasses, they don't belong on the coffee table anymore. You know, they're up high, they're on top of the breakfast bar or on top of the fridge if you've got a Great Dane, um, get things up out of the way. Uh, shut the wardrobe doors, put the lid on the laundry hamper as much as we can, um, puppy proof the house. Uh, crank training um, and or using an exercise or a playpen uh, is also really valuable, uh, but we're teaching it in a really positive way. So this becomes like your doggy's bedroom. It's a nice safe place that they feel really comfortable in. Um, it's where I do a lot of, so they get their stuffed Kongs in there. Lots of really positive things happen when they're in their crate or their playpen. Um, and again, a really nice management tool. Uh, and also make use of your lead. Um, you know, we use the lead to take them out and about for walks, but we can absolutely use it ar around the house. Uh, so you might have some friends coming over and they've got some little kids coming with them and your puppy's still kind of learning the social skills and to, you know, um, not jump on people. So pop them on lead, have some treats in your pocket, be ready to do some training. Lots of little skills we're going to teach um, in classes to help you with that. Um, but you know that lead can really help you manage your environment as well. Next one is to know behavior is everywhere. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at behavior. And most behaviors can be divided into two categories. So your desirable behaviors and your undesirable. So the things you like your dog to doing, um, really highly reinforce it at this stage. Think about what's reinforcing for your dog. So food, what toys do they like? What games do they like? What kind of attention and interactions with you do they really enjoy? And where they're, when they're doing the good stuff, when they're being a really good dog, make sure you highly reinforce it. The more we reinforce a behavior, the more they will offer it. Then we're going to move to the undesirable stuff. So a lot of the undesirable stuff can be normal doggy behavior. It's just in a family home. It may not be desirable. So really important that the big word I want you to take away is to redirect. So think about what behavior would you like instead? Then show them that, teach them that, reinforce that. So for example, I have a young puppy who's deciding that they want to chew on my really expensive running shoes. Um, I'm going to redirect them. They're being a puppy. They're being a dog. It's what dogs do. They chew on stuff. So I'm going to show them, oh, look, I've got a really yummy stuffed Kong. Oh, look, and here's your bed. How about you lie on your bed or your mat and you chew on that and then you tell them how good they are and they get to see and enjoy their Kong and, and have lots of fun. So keep that in mind. If there's some undesirable stuff, what would you like to do instead? Show, teach and reinforce. And I'm going to leave you with a quote from the amazing Dr. Susan Friedman. The key question is not how do I stop the pet's problem behavior? Rather, it's what do I want the animal to do instead? 
then teach it. Um, and hopefully um, that's what we're here for. We can help you teach it. Thank you so much for listening to the presentation. I'm sure your dog says a huge big thank you as well. Uh, hopefully you've learnt um, a little bit more about them today and you've got some new skills that you can introduce at home. Thank you very much for listening.